Kia ora everyone, welcome to this Fabian session. I'm Philip, I'm um, delighted to welcome tonight two speakers, Adrian who's here in person and David Frame who'll join us shortly on screen. Um, better ways to do climate policy. Adrian is, was vice chair, then chair of the negotiations in 2010 that established the Kyoto Protocol. Um, he's um, an adjunct professor now at the New Zealand Climate Change Research Institute. David, you'll know as Professor of Climate Change at the University of Canterbury, and he's been a lead author on the fifth and the sixth assessment reports of IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I have to have it written down. Um, and over to you, Adrian. Welcome and thank you for coming. Okay, kia ora tato. Thank you, uh, Philip. Um, We've picked a slightly broader title for this opening bit uh, compared, I think, with what was in the uh, information. My sense was it would be quite useful just to spend a bit of time tossing around climate change itself as an issue and see how it's sort of been framed by people in o over the years. Because I think it's if you ask – what I often do when we're having a – we're doing a, a lecture, to say, to uh, a science class um, – start off by saying, just think you've got a 12-year-old who's asked you, well, what's, this, what's the problem with climate change and, and what do we need to do to, to fix it? And the challenge is to come up with two sentences, plain English, which answer that question from the 12-year-old. And A, it's people find it very difficult. Um, people cannot come up with short sentences. And B, how they express the problem, how they see the problem, is really uh, is hugely diverse. So it's a little bit the theme I wanted to start with. So the idea with uh, Dave and me was that I would start on that was it general stuff, and then we'll focus in on more the science side. So Dave will get to the nitty gritty with the aid of some atmospheric physics, but no jargon um, of where he, as a scientist, sees the issue. Dave, I should also say, has worked as a public official and he's also got qualifications in philosophy, including ethics, which are rather relevant to the climate change discussion. So, And then we would bring it after those two... And he'll talk a bit about... Um, mine will be a bit of a segue towards um, the New Zealand situation, but um, he'll talk a bit about New Zealand. And then um, we'll get on to... I've described it simply as um, the $30 billion issue, and this is a little bit what we've been writing about, Dave and I, recently, the public policy aspects of uh, how New Zealand has reached its international climate change contribution. And that, I thought that probably as a, as a discussion, more like a conversation than a, than a presentation. For anyone who's interested in, in our thoughts on that issue in, in more depth, we've written uh, a series for Patrick Smelly's business desk. There's a series of five articles which came out uh, a few weeks ago covering uh, a bit of the history of uh, New Zealand's climate positions and a bit of a diagno diagnosis of where we got and some suggestions about whether there'd be things we could uh, do better. Right, well, I'll see if we can... Right, now you've heard that you would presumably, most of you, all of you would have heard the news from the latest COP. Oh, there's Dave there, is he? But Sham El Sheikh. This was COP 27. COP, uh, just a quick question. Does anybody, how many people know what a COP is? About half. Okay, so the COP <laughs> is simply conference of the parties. Under a treaty, you generally have an annual conference or a biannual conference of the members of the treaty, and that's all that the COP is. It goes back to the Climate Convention, 1992, and we're up to COP 27. So a, a cynical view would be this is our 27th attempt to save the planet and fail at it. Right. What you what you hear about cops is not necessarily very close to the reality, but we'll get onto that. Um, now here's Ban Ki Moon. He made climate change a real feature of his tenure. Time for education is over. Science is clear. Climate change is happening. Impact is real. Unless we act, there'll be serious consequences. And he goes through the list. Two thousand and seven. Well, we didn't really get very far 
until 2015. And finally, there was a success. Um, I, can I presume everybody has heard of the Paris Agreement, which is the new climate agreement. It is a universal agreement, unlike the Kyoto Protocol, unlike the Convention, all countries now are expected to reduce emissions. We have for the first time a temperature target, which is to keep global warming uh, well, below, well below 2 degrees and towards 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Another important concept is that how you do it, you must reach a balance, what they call a balance of sources and sinks. What exactly that means is uh, subject to different views, but roughly it means you need to stop if you've got sources of greenhouse gas emissions uh, and sinks to mop some of them up um, or all of them up, you're no longer warming the planet. So net zero is roughly what we're saying. And there's other features of Paris, much more recognition of the need for assistance to developing countries uh, on adaptation, a strong recognition of uh, the, the need for finance. Um, I mean, one of the problems of this negotiation all through has been that Back in 1992, uh, the world was divided into uh, develop, developing rich and poor. And unfortunately, that paradigm uh, has continued on through the negotiations and has been a massive constraint on making progress. Um, I won't go into the details why, but we can in, in q and if you want. And the rich-poor thing means that there is still a huge expectation on the part of many of the developing countries in that negotiation that we want to see more from you rich countries. It's your responsibility. And you'll note that the feature of the last COP was this loss and damage, which has been, it's a big, it's a political win, and it's been expressed as finally the rich countries agreed to pay up, pay these countries who've had damage and can't really um, adapt to climate change with small island states and others. That's how it's been um, portrayed. But think about that. China's GDP, since the, that list was established, and China wants to be part of that developed country, developing country um, list, the poor country list, their GDP between 1992 and this year has gone up 3,330%. So there are many, many countries under the um, poor developing side who are way, way wealthier than a lot of the OCD countries, which is a real challenge for the negotiations, and Paris managed to overcome that. Um, let's step forward to COP27. What did the UN Secretary General Guterres say? Greenhouse get emissions keep growing, global temperatures keep rising, and our planet is fast approaching tipping points that will make climate chaos irreversible. We're on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Now, those two comments were a long, long time apart, um, but, but so similar. Um, this is Greenpeace's effort quite a few years ago too. Theme time is running out. Um, this is quite, as I think, round about all the late 2000s. Uh, the, the way these people see the problem, it's up to the rich countries to pay that climate debt, and it's more or less what James Shaw was saying in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh, that, well, we benefited from the Industrial Revolution, time to pay something back. So there they were in, I think it might be 2007, I'm not quite sure. And here we are, 2022, Sharm el-Sheikh, same message uh, being promulgated by largely Western NGOs. Um, when I give our talks to Rafes and other classes, I, Always quote. Well, I make two quotes. One um, from Australian advisor Ross Garneau to the Australian government, saying climate change is a diabolical policy problem. But then the second quote I give is from Mikhail Kalashnikov, who was in, who was interviewed a few years before his death, and asked, "What was the secret of this weapon that he produced? This rifle? It worked, you know, deserts, oceans, everywhere, incredibly reliable." And he said, "Everything that." Is, ne is necessary, or anything that was necessary is sim was kept simple. And that point, uh, nothing more necessary than dealing with climate change, but there's a real challenge in how you actually express the core of the problem, how you actually simplify the problem. And there are different, many different ways uh, of doing it. This is another one from this year. Pay up, rich countries pay up effectively. Um, 
If you're a demographer, the evidence is absolutely clear, and uh, probably Len would agree with that correlation. So, huge correlation of greenhouse gas emissions and population solution, population policy. Uh, if you're left-wing leaning, it's capitalism, the exploitation of the world's resources by unbridled capitalism. And this was actually part of an actual submission by Bolivia to one of the cops. They were making a submission on various points, and then at the end they said, well, in any case, we can't do anything about it unless we destroy capitalism. Uh, or is it farming, livestock farming, as these Kiwis are saying? Many people have sympathy with that view, particularly in regard to New Zealand's emissions. Simplify it, stop eating meat. You've got a choice, save the climate or eat meat. Uh, if you are post, a post-colonialist inclined, you don't do simple, but roughly <laughs> you can see the, more or less the line there, co colonialism and imperialism. Or maybe it's indigenous people who are the solution. A lot more emphasis on indigenous people, actually, um, after the, in the Paris Agreement and later. But what about degrowth? You've seen a lot about this um, recently. Um, there's just a sense, it's no use talking about technology, you, you just have to stop consumption. So as, whereas one uh, group of people would see growing population as a problem, another is just our consumption, our excessive consumption, that is the behaviour, get off that, um, just get off that uh, track. Um, if you are a Republican, that's French, I was did a slide was originally in the presentation in France. If you're a Republican congressman, um, technology's there, technology will fix everything, and certainly bureaucrats, all these negotiators talking themselves silly, won't. And just to, it's a point I made in an interview on the radio, um, what we're doing with Cops Latterly, we, we're sending the population of Ashburton somewhere in the world and expecting to, to save the planet with 35,000 people all all crammed into one small place. Um, this is the techno fixes. I won't go into this, but the various uh, uh, magical geoengineering solutions, as if you can't reduce your emissions enough. You know, you can shoot up uh, uh, giant mirrors in the sky. You can um, inject CO2 underground, iron filings in the ocean, uh, w water vapor going. There's all sorts of things um, which have been proposed. And this is an interesting one because this is an economist statement, the largest statement of economists in history, they say, with many Nobel Prize winners, January 2019. Included in that was Amartya Sen, which was interesting, who's not exactly um, a raving free marketeer. A carbon tax offers the most cost-effective lever to reduce carbon emissions at the scale and speed that is necessary. So what is, I mean, you're probably sympathetic to some of those views, but is any, has any one of those views got to the core? Um, in my view, they're all, none of them are entirely wrong. Um, some are more wrong than others. Uh, there is truth and some truth in just about all of them, but the ones that may be more true, they're utopian. So it's just not a practical, solu not, not a practical solution to choose that, that simplification. So that's, that's the challenge. I won't give you my own simplification, but um, it's certainly not loss and damage as came out from this COP. And incidentally, though it was, put as, it was portrayed as a great political success, uh, nothing has been agreed. Um, and this is just a bit of a quirk of these negotiations. And there's a wonderful little footnote that says, right at the beginning of that decision, which is agreement on loss and damage, setting up a fund, it says, um, well, in plain English, it says more or less, well, um, we might have agreed in extremis to get an outcome from this COP, but don't think we're going to be agreeing with it any further when we discuss it all through next year. They set up a 24-country committee with two co-chairs, meetings all through the year, workshops, who are trying to get this thing set up in a year's time. Don't hold your breath on that one. Right. Um, this, as it's Christmas, I thought this quote was actually rather appropriate. The climate energy challenge has become a Christmas tree on which we hang our own baubles, using it to advance agendas that are tangential rather than essential 
to deep decarbonisation, worth, I think, reflecting on that. The climate change and lexicon is hundreds, if not thousands, of words long, and you know, you've, got to, you've got a cause that you've got to you'd feel deeply about. Hitch it to the climate change wagon, which is sort of the most prominent and uh, most high-profile issue going. Going to start on the segue to New Zealand. Um, you know that forests have been a big issue in, uh, in government policy recently, and there's been quite a few flip-flops. I think we first heard that we're going to be, uh, we'll solve our problems with a billion trees, and then people were a little bit worried, well, hang on, do we really want to plaster the whole country with uh, pine trees? Uh, what about rural employment? What about effect on local economy? Um, what about biodiversity? So then the government decided, oh, actually, no, we don't think that's a good idea either, so we're going to just restrict these to native forests. Um, I'll, t I'll just go back. We just restrict these to, to, to native forests. Um, and then the forest owners say, well, hang on a minute, we've, we've invested based on value in future trees. And um, then the iwi interests say, well, this is our land, we, we want to make money out of, out of those trees. So the government's flip-flop back on that one, so pine trees are back on the agenda. But this is a good example from, uh, and this is the real effect of climate policy on the economy. Just going, I'll go back one slide. This was in 2013 the units surrendered under the ETS, in other words, you have to pay for your emissions. Um, what's going on here with like 90.7%, this is what was surrendered under the ETS, so theoretically helping New Zealand reduce its emissions. That was all um, hot air from Ukraine at around about 20 cents a tonne, um, whereas to make it worthwhile at the time to grow trees for carbon, you needed at least 15 New Zealand dollars a tonne. But that, that was the effect. And this is the effect on this guy who had been planting all those seedlings, growing all those seedlings in the expectation that there would be a carbon price that would just buy. So it just shows you how, this, how linked this, uh, this all is. Um, that was going to be my segue through to the um, discussion of, well, A, a the science from Dave, uh, and B will get on to uh, New Zealand policy. Yeah. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about the warming aspect of climate change, the science aspect of climate change. Um, uh, talking about climate policy's ultimate aim. Um, the ultimate aim of climate policy, according to the UN Framework Convention, is the stabilisation of greenhouse gas concentrations in the, atmos in the atmosphere at a level that would prevent change in anthropogenic interference with the climate system. The thing was, they didn't really have numbers on that when they agreed that back in 1992. That's from the Framework Convention, kind of the, the underpinning document of, of what the world thinks it's doing on climate change. But really, the ultimate aim of climate change would be determined by when people sort of stop working on it and where greenhouse gases tend to over time. Uh, and we don't actually have a strong control over that because it's future generations that will decide that. Um, what it requires is close to net zero emissions of uh, long-lived gases such as carbon dioxide and, and constant emissions or even declining emissions under some conditions of short-lived gases such as methane. Um, and the, the temperature targets imply cumulative limits um, because it's the, there's a linear relationship, so a commitment to remain under any temperature target, two degrees, three degrees, whatever, is... Uh, amounts to a commitment to stop emitting greenhouse gases, uh, stop emitting carbon dioxide um, above some level, that is, get to net zero. And the timing, the details of the timing matter less than the total quantity of CO2 emitted. So in this slide, I use a climate model called SPARE, which was used by the IPCC, um, and I ran a whole bunch of um, emissions scenarios that I colored by the cumulative emissions in the um, uh, so that the, the light colours up here are um, a large amount of CO2 and the dark colours are a small amount of CO2. And what you see is that the details of the timing don't really matter. The concentrations kind of shake down over time, so they tend to a limit, because for those of you who like maths, you're integrating the area under this curve, and that's why you end up with the same value in concentrations. And then you end up with the same warming arising from that 
So that's where the idea of net zero comes from, is that you don't, you don't flatten off this warming line until you get to zero on your mm. emissions. Where current emissions come from, or current warming comes from, this is from the last IPCC report, this is chapter seven, I was an author on this one, um, on this chapter. Uh, um, we've had about a degrees warming from CO2, and it's the purple line, and you can, the, the black line is the observations, that's observed warming, that's the total warming, that's the sum of all the contributions. The, the dominant term, far and away, and increasingly so, is carbon dioxide. Um, the next largest term is actually aerosol cooling. So this is um, this is uh, aerosols, tiny particles in the atmosphere, often produced by, they can be produced um, from being kicked up from dust, um, but one of the main sources is actually the combustion of coal, where sulfates, um, little sulfate impurities lie in there. They get kicked up into space through industrial pollution, coal burning and so on, um, picked up into the atmosphere, uh, that is, and um, they actually uh, offset the warming, but they only last a couple of weeks. Each individual particle only has a resonance time of a couple of weeks in the atmosphere. Uh, but that actually amounts to um, offsetting about, you know, about half a degree. Volcanoes are the spiky one here. Uh, and they can they can mask warming temporarily, and it's actually through the same sorts of effect as aerosols that they do that. So in many cases, they are aerosols that get into the up into the stratosphere. So that's the big spikes down with it, but that's a natural forcing. These are anthropogenic ones. Um, and then the next largest term, of course, is uh, methane. Uh, nitrous oxide is 0.1 degree, and halogenated gases industrial gas is basically 0.2 degrees so that's where our current warming comes from and and pretty clearly the thing that will stabilize the warming is getting the co2 under control um and uh and we expect to clean up the atmosphere over the next 50 years and that will unmask warming that we've already committed to by burning co2 um how much warming we expect depends on the emission scenarios i've used some old money here some of the old scenarios from the 90s uh, because I thought they were interesting um, and because they had a cumulative emissions slide back before there was a general realization that this problem is all about that warming is linear and cumulative emissions so I just added a ruler using the transient climate response to cumulative emissions that gives you the warming associated with any given amount of cumulative emissions and what, what you see is that under most scenarios uh, even the one we talked about in the 90s um, and, early 2000s, you expect a, probably a bit less than four degrees of warming this century. Um, there aren't many scenarios giving you much more warming than that. You actually have to, um, to make some strange choices about how future societies will behave to get above four or five degrees. We can talk about that if you're interested. Uh, but most of them, you know, we probably, people say at the moment we're on course for somewhere around between two and a half and three degrees uh, with current policies as they are. Um, okay, so we have a commitment that some people uh, read into the Kyoto Protocol, um, but not everyone. So um, the, the, the actual, sorry, not the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, uh, I've had a little tiny. Um, the Paris Agreement says we're going to remain well below two degrees and we'll continue to pursue efforts towards one and a half. Some people uh, interpret this as a one and a half degree target, though that's actually not what the text says. Um, and uh, that would require, this is a slide from Glenn Peters, who's Director of Research at a large climate shop in um, Norway, that requires 8% per annum reductions compounding 8% per annum reductions in carbon dioxide emissions uh, from now until 2050, which I think is that 8% that compounding is the exponential curve here. But basically, you need to get find some way of falling off a cliff, having the emissions fall off a cliff. The, the at 8% per annum, COVID in 2020 knocked 6% off global CO2 emissions, which have since bounced back pretty much fully. Uh, so you need a COVID and a third um, with no rebound for 30 years to stay under one and a half degrees. The world champs, over the last 15 years, the world champs of emissions reduction uh, are the UK, which has achieved it through a combination of policy, industrial policy, pricing strategies, 
and a big dollop of offshoring their emissions through migration um, away from manufacturing and so on to, to the service economy. Um, so importing emissions rather than having them accounted for in your own inventory. Um, uh, and they have reduced emissions at about 2.3% per annum over that 15 year period. So they're kind of the world champs at this and they've had 2.3% emissions reductions and we need 8% globally. So my analogy for that is like, it's like saying to Usain Bolt, well, you very good effort. You ran the, what, the 100 meters in 9.59 seconds. Now you and this whole group of people have to average three seconds um, for, the, for the same event. So one and a half degrees isn't going to happen. Uh, we have it, however, in our legislation, which I, I, I find uh, a, a strange choice and a hostage to fortune. The, the world as a whole are moving towards net zero targets, but in general, um, they aren't pegging themselves, they aren't, you know, kind of hanging, hanging that uh, directly onto a temperature target. So Denmark says, and, and note the range of different interpretations here, or different phrasings, Climate neutral by 2050. Now, to me, climate neutral means we are no longer um, affecting the climate. We're no longer increasing temperatures. Fiji net zero emissions by 2050. That could mean a range of things depending on what you mean by emissions. Uh, Finland, the government's decision to put path, uh, Finland on a path towards achieving carbon neutrality by 2035. So whether that's carbon is in carbon dioxide or carbon is in all greenhouse gases, or carbon is in only the greenhouse gases that involve carbon. I don't don't know. You could you could presumably argue about that. Iceland says carbon neutral for 2050. Blah blah blah. Uh, so all of these guys, you know, Norway, who I think are fairly sophisticated about some of this, these points about other gases, say climate neutrality. Um, so uh, there's a range. The issue for New Zealand is that we have a target that. Let me just move that thing down to there, uh, yeah. Hmm. New Zealand has a target that says um, that our compatible, that you, you set um, an emissions goal that is compatible with what the world needs to do to stay under one and a half degrees. So if we take that to mean what is the global required emissions reduction rate to stay under one and a half degrees, um, then it would be the blue line here in emissions. So focus on the blue line. Now imagine, that, so New Zealand is, you know, less than a percent of emissions or around about a percent of global emissions, depending on what you mean by emissions. Uh, imagine eight years go by and global emissions are still at 10 gigatons of carbon uh, um, by in, in eight years' time. Um, in that case, what the world needs to do is actually decline at the rate given by the orange curve to stay under one and a half degrees. So you end up then having to steepen, even even if you were meeting your emissions reduction target that you set in 2020, the, the phrasing compatible with what the world needs to do to stay under one and a half degrees, the very vast majority of which is not determined by your actions but by those of others, means you have to live within it, you have to continue to tighten your belt and have your emissions fall even faster. And then another eight years go by and there's no budget left because the world is, if the world continues to emit that 10 gigatons of carbon per annum, then there's no budget left. And you, even if you were doing what you said you would do, even if you were meeting your original 2020 target, um, what the world would have to do to stay under one and a half degrees uh, is then have zero carbon emissions. And so then instead of thinking that your carbon, your warming, your contribution of warming is going to look like the blue curve, um, it would end up um, actually having to look like the black curve. So you end up contributing less to warming because others are not doing their bit. This is sometimes called taking up the slack in some of the climate ethics literature. Um, it seems a strange thing for a small country, small trading country with no CO2 industries to undertake, um, or few CO2 industries. So you, this is just walking you through that slide. Um, so as long as you reduce emissions faster than the world as a whole, you keep allocating yourself an ever shrinking budget. That's the basic point. It doesn't really, the, the details don't turn on whether you stay at 10. The result turns on your line, your emissions reductions target being faster than what the world as a whole needs to do. Then you 
keep allocating yourself any shrinking carbon budget. This is presumably why no one else does it this way. I raised this with researchers um, who work at the Science Policy Interface in Norway and the UK, uh, and it's quite conspicuous that they did nothing like this. Um, and and the, the other problem, the other dimension, I think, that's really worth picking out in the carbon budget area is, uh, this is a quote from Tom Schelling, who wrote a, a terrific piece, only a couple of parts of which have dated in the 1990s, um, uh, some economics of global warming, where the current popular, he, he says, current popular expectation that any participation in greenhouse gas regime take the form of commitments to specified emissions reductions plans. So read that as emissions reductions plans. Below those of some specific year, like 1990 or 2000. This is about the Kyoto Protocol. The same logic applies to net zero targets. That you're setting this target about where your emissions are going to be 30 years down the track. When you, when you don't really know much about the rest of the global context, the economic context, the technological context for that, for that um, choice. And he says, I cannot help believing that the adoption of such a commitment is an indication of insincerity. A serious proposal would specify policies, taxes, regulations, subsidies, programs like R&D accompanied by very uncertain estimates of their likely effects on emissions. And so this is where, by setting it from targets and future goals, brand visions and then let it, and then saying we'll do whatever we have to to meet it, you've actually put the cart before the horse and it's totally a totally unconvincing way to go about doing policy. Normally, so in, strategy is the art of art and science and craft of, of matching capabilities to aspirations. And in this case, what we have is aspirations that we have no idea how we're going to meet. And they're then, they're then trying, people have been picking up our capabilities on the basis that we'll, we'll need to have the capabilities expand to match the aspirations, but it's not obvious that that's um, an easy thing to do. And the world is littered with examples of strategic overreach where people's aspirations, such as Napoleon's in Russia, for instance, easily outran their capabilities and calamity ensued. Um, that's really the main point I wanted to make, that I think there are major problems in how we've structured our intentions to our approaches to carbon budgets. Um, this is all beyond, because it's all referring to things that are already agreed in legislation, um, it's a little beyond what the Climate Change Commission can do. In any case, they're not really an independent body. They're ministerial appointees responding to queries from the minister um, who, can, who knows, you know, where the thorny issues are buried, so they can't kind of, it's not entirely their fault, they can't really kind of um, address this. This is just a point that not all greenhouse gases are the same. Cumulative emissions, so the, the longer of gases, the warming goes as the area under the curve of the emissions, so if you have increase in carbon dioxide emissions, you have um, accelerating warming, you have constant CO2 emissions, you have linearly increasing warming, if you have falling CO2 emissions, you have slowly decreasing um, warming, whereas short-lived gases, the warming just follows what the emissions are doing. And this is why we should regulate them separately, why we regulate um, you know, uh, pollutants that break down, like alcohol in our bloodstream, differently from how we regulate lead and mercury, which don't break down in our bloodstream. Uh, we have this peculiar way of pretending that these things are exchangeable um, using CO2 equivalents, which is a really bad idea that doesn't really work very well. Uh, and one of the reasons it doesn't work, uh, I might finish on the slide actually, is because if you look, take one year's um, emissions of methane in the, in the over, what, six or seven year period, this year's emissions of methane result in more warming than this year's emissions of carbon dioxide. But this year's of emissions of methane matter less and less over time as, as time goes by as that methane breaks down, um, whereas this year's emissions of CO2 are a permanent legacy for the climate. And that is the only gas, really, of which that is true. Um, OK. Uh, and then you can have a conversation about what level of warming we want, which is actually how I think we should probably structure our our conversations. I think we've kind of already done this by having a two-basket approach policy. What level of emissions reductions are required to prevent any further warming from the three main gases? You need negative emissions or zero emissions immediately from CO2. 
negative or zero emissions immediately from nitrous oxide, and you can maintain 99.7% per annum of the previous year's emissions for methane and not cause further warming. So, um, so there's a big difference between these, and that's why it's important to treat these differently. I've got other slides if anybody's interested in that stuff. Ah, uh, what have I got? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can, I'll, I think I'll leave it there. Dave, Dave could you, can you hear yeah. Can you uh, just on your last point um, on methane, you decrease it by 0.3 per cent per annum, and you're you're at climate neutrality. But I mean, I think the discussion here is okay. That's fine, but we want methane to go down. So, can you talk about the potential for when you reduce methane, how much less, how much reduction can we end up in global to final global temperature? What was what's the what's the scale? Oh, so, um, so if you do that. Same temperature outcome. So this is my actually was the next slide. Um, th these are both one and a half degree scenarios, the red and the blue one. In the red, um, you notice that both of them have to get at some point um, carbon dioxide, fossil carbon emissions to zero. Right? That's the main. The, that's the necessary condition for stopping warming. Um, it's almost sufficient. Um, the but but whether or not you you leave more warming space for higher methane emissions, which is what the red curve does, or you reduce methane and then um, you can emit a bit more CO2 to the same temperature, which is what the blue curve does, that's the way in which they're exchangeable. Um, but uh, they, um, uh, so, it, but it, they're constrained by the fact that globally, you've only got 0.3 degrees of methane, of warming associated with methane. You're getting that almost per decade from CO2 um, now. So you could go really big on methane. You can buy down some of that methane, that warming from methane. That's a good thing if it's not coming the expense of effort on CO2. But the increment, the decadal increment on the, on the um, CO2 is almost as large as the, um, as the total warming from methane. Okay, can I stop there? Oh, that's Phil. <laughs> yeah, that's. I'm going to stop there. Yeah, I mean, I think. Okay. But can I just say maybe one? It seems a bit pessimistic, all this, but this? it's not working, is it? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Um, just, just one point. I mean, the, the reason for um, mentioning all those cops to start with. Uh, was just to acknowledge that's that's sort of the way that the the world and public opinion tends to focus. But that is actually um, now very much a, a lowest common denominator, and there's an awful lot that is actually happening um, despite the cops and massive uh, massive change in attitudes um, and action from business, from governments, from cities, from um, subnational entities. Um, and a lot focused on on the sort of energy transition, a lot focused on lower carbon footprints. So, in, in fact, the Paris Agreement was a was a good pivot to a new, more robust global framework. And we don't need people in these. Uh, we don't need thousands of people to every year negotiating by Nutier to enable this stuff to happen. And I'll go back to what my simplification um, of all those people, all those different options. My simplification I mentioned on the radio, you know, how do we know if we're going to be successful? Well, the key, for me, the key, the key issue is how fast are the um, 20 largest uh, economies in the world going to make the transition from fossil fuels to renewables? They represent about 80-something, 80 80-85% of global emissions. That's actually what's, that's the thing, that's the key critical factor for how, when and how high we, as global temperature is going to, going to stabilise. So, and for me, what I saw, um, one useful thing I saw coming out of, the, of that COP was nothing to do with the COP itself. It was just an announcement that um, people make these announcements at the COP. It's like your, your big uh, trade fair show and tell. The Americans came up, the Biden administration, out of their $300 billion that they're, they're putting in for their um, climate work, mm. this concept of an, e an energy transition accelerator. And that's the concept of that is it's, it's government 
with the with the private sector working in developing countries to do exactly to accelerate the transition from fossils to renewables and to my mind that was right on the right on the button for what action has to happen whereas the loss and damage thing frankly was um, completely peripheral um, so that's something that's an initiative that was not dependent on on those negotiations but having had those very clear uh, uh, principles and targets in the Paris Agreement, they are actually proving something against which you can align your own policies and you don't need uh, governments to, to tell you how to do that. So I think that's, um, and the acceleration of take up in technologies, mm. they're, they're, to, they're to me um, are, are much more positive signals than you get by looking at the, the disastrous um, negotiations, which are absolutely the worst. And I've done negotiations for 30 plus years and the climate negotiations are the worst, by, by far the worst example of an international negotiation ever. Most of the key decisions uh, which led to the Paris Agreement were actually decisions taken despite the climate negotiators, despite the climate mm. negotiation rather than in the negotiation. So we could get on to the... Do we want to... We can, uh, we're going to make this the rest of the conversation, so we can, we, I mean, what Dave and I were writing about was, you know, uh, the New Zealand government, how it was positioning a policy, and, and just very quickly, under Paris, you, you all have to make a contribution. Um, this very last, the semantics of contribution are fascinating, because it's a word that reconciles commitment, which is legally binding, and action, which is not legally binding. The word contribution is uh, its universal. Everyone has to make a contribution, but it's ambiguous as whether it's legally binding or not. Our contribution is to, at the moment, it's to halve our, uh, our emissions by 2030, uh, except that it isn't, because only about the modelling shows only about 30% of that um, would be done uh, in New Zealand. The rest, the other 70%, requires offshore mitigation and the Climate Commission itself calculated on a pretty conservative uh, assumption about carbon price that that is a cost in the economy of 30 plus billion dollars over the next eight years. And that was the point that struck Dave and me and that we wrote about in this uh, series for Business Desk. And I think that the diagnosis of what went wrong there is that, as Dave really outlined, unlike every other government which which decided, okay, let's see how far we can go. How much can we reduce our emissions by? You know, look at all our different sectors, work out what we can do, shove that target in as our international target. But New Zealand took a very quirky approach, started from the top, uh, started from some uh, s global scenarios, uh, and sort of said, oh, okay, well, we should, we, uh, we'll, we'll use that as the base, the global scenario, which is uh, put forward by the IPCC, never intended to be applied to a, a country. Uh, we'll use that as a base, but because we're a rich country, we need to go even further, and we need to get right down towards that, align ourselves with 1.5 degrees, and we've been right at the lowest uh, quartile of emissions under that IPCC. So we sort of ended up in, a, uh, in, in that top down, and that's basically what, where we're currently at. I mean, neither Dave nor I nor, nor most people think that $30 billion is sustainable against uh, calls from you know, education, health, social welfare, you name it, over the next eight years. So it's an interesting conundrum, but it's, a, it's been a, a good example, I think, well, a, a bad example of a public policy process because it's clear that there, were, there was no, I mean, there was that item, you, you, you find that $30 billion if you, if you plough your way through the Climate Commission report on about page 197, you, you'll see it there, but there's been absolutely no discussion about it. So just set a bit of a context, both a little bit more optimism on, on, on what is happening internationally and just a bit of explanation as to um, why we wrote about the, the, where the New Zealand situation got to. So, so the $30 billion just buys up well, means we don't have to do too much reduction of emissions. No, I mean, that, that under, under the Kyoto Protocol, it's, it's, it was, that, was, that system of carbon trading was introduced because only developed countries, only rich countries had commitments. So the idea was, OK, do what you can, but the planet doesn't care where emissions happen, so uh, pay, pay some other countries to reduce them and you can, you can, um, you can basically pay them and up the offset your um, emissions that way. Yeah, that was it. And one of the problems with um, the... Um, Thirty billion is that it just doesn't get us on the road of decarbonising our own economy, and you would have to actually keep paying that 
because um, so it, you it, you would be paying for the emission reductions that you didn't make, um, and then uh, you would have to be paying for the ones that you are making in the next period if you wanted to keep falling at the same rate. And so it doesn't really get you the thirty billion overseas doesn't really help you with your decarbonisation journey. Um, and there are uh, these other things like loss and damage in here. They may they may persist. They may become a big deal. Um, and uh, there is a sense in which I think the arguments for helping the Pacific are stronger on the, the, the pure ethical arguments associated with climate change are much stronger in a loss and damage sense for compensating the Pacific than they are for helping them on the decarbonisation journey, even though it's actually the deep. Oh. Uh, we've lost you, Dave. Yeah, the, the, the bad news, uh, the, the 30 billion was the uh, direct cost of what the commission estimate, direct cost of purchasing, however we did it through investment or buying carbon credits, on, on a non-existent international market, we haven't created the market yet, uh, plus the indirect cost of all that money being invested offshore and not in the New Zealand economy. Um, and I think, the, if you like, that, that, that it's a consequence of this obsession with... Um, not use the word obsession, this obsession with targets, rather than, I think, the much more, much more healthy um, and operational way to see things should be transitions. Because when you talk about transition, you know where you're transitioning. You're transitioning to net zero, and you, that make, it's a more dynamic thing. And rather than setting up unrealistic targets and getting praise from the world for being world leading, seeing how far and fast you can transition each sector of your economy um, I think is a much more sound way of doing it. And, and I would uh, separate out the aspect of assistance to developing countries out of that market altogether. And, and we want to do things for the Pacific. Uh, what Dave and I were saying is much more effective. Go and talk to the Pacific Islands directly. What do they want? Use, uh, use that, not, not have something that we have to offset against, um, against um, our own emissions. So anyway, there are different ways of doing things, but... Um, that's, that's, I think, the, the main dilemma that, that we've got ourselves into. Yeah, questions? Um, uh, a question for you, Adrian, and taking your point about the importance of what the major economies do, and in light of your previous ambassadorial roles, do you think that the energy crisis in Europe and the sky-high prices they face will galvanise serious action towards um, decarbonisation there? Because in many ways it is a stonking great carbon tax that they're facing, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think it's highlighted, certainly what, what this has highlighted is all this wonderful talk about getting to net zero, what we realise is how, even some of the best performing economies, how dependent they still are on fossil fuels. Um, but I think if you wanted a single means of hastening the shift to renewables, um, Vladimir Putin is actually it. I think that there's a, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you know, there are many lives being lost, sells but... Elsewhere. What's that, sorry? Not if he sells it elsewhere. Well, well no, he's <laughs> still, but he's, but those, but that means that those countries, at least those countries that were purchasing, I mean, will be, will be, will be hasting their shift. And then, I mean, as things move forward, then the economics shift, too, and then the economics have shifted hugely on. When I first started the negotiations in 2005, um, Reducing emissions, in other words, shifting off, off fossil fuels, was a cost, and it was how do you share out this cost? Well, that's no longer the, that that paradigm is no longer true. Maybe true for some countries, but for like for New Zealand, if you want to set up a new power station, you're not going to build a coal-fired one. You're going to do wind or solar or geothermal. And isn't that what the Europeans need to do at pace and at yeah. scale? And, and probably, new, um, I mean, I think nuclear is going to clearly nuclear will um, return probably even a bit much better shape than previously. Thanks, um, <coughs> thanks, Adrian and Dave for... Uh, is Dave back or is he oh. still there? Uh, oh. I'm here, yeah. Oh, he's there. Oh, good. <laughs>
billion or so in that so you know is, is actually a huge amount when you think about that's about what we invest in, in transport uh, and well and it's an Auckland light rail project which national says was unaffordable at half the price that coming yeah. that you know just to get credits to to put things you didn't do so um, it's fatuous politically to think that that might be a solution well I think there's, and also there's really bad news that nobody seems to realize is that that 30 billion is not a purchase it's a loan because at the end of the commitment but at the end of that period if we haven't reduced our emissions we're gonna have to rebuy all that stuff again but I, I don't think anybody really thinks it's sustainable <laughs> I mean, there, I think there's two things there going. I mean, one is this desire to be a world leader. Um, if you want to know, you know, why is it so difficult for us to have a... Um, w w the, the fear is that we can't get a respectable number in terms of what percentage of we reduce our emissions by. That goes back partly to the question of the wrong measurement of the poor measurement of emissions. But it also goes right back to two features of our economy. One, already a very high percentage of renewable electricity, and B agriculture being such a large proportion of our emissions, both of those factors, which we're not, we're not we're in a way, we're our emissions per unit of production, we're pretty respectable in both those, but both of those factors mean that it's much harder for New Zealand to do an X, a percentage X reduction. Testing. Testing. That's why, to be respectable, there's been this uh, feeling that we need to, need to have that overseas component. And every other, and it, every other country, as I said, they've looked at what they can do. We, one of the a point we made in, in that article is that the, the most common burden-sharing principle all through, the, all through my time in the negotiations has been the cost to your economy of making those reductions. You've had these um, you know, McKinsey curves showing the cost of uh, increasing reductions in CO2. That has been a, an accepted burden-sharing principle. But the Commission just threw that, just completely ignored it. That to the Commission, the, and, and the government adopted the recommendations, the only thing that was relevant was that headline number. And the only significance of the cost, the domestic thing, was how much we would, could do it at home, and the Commission has estimated that, and all the rest simply has to be done abroad. There was no consideration whatsoever of the cost of the economy. There was a little... I know you're an ex-Treasury person. Was a, in the cabinet papers, a, a plaintive note from the Treasury saying, this, this, looks like, this looks like way more expensive than, than for New Zealand than for other countries, and there's been no analysis, and what about some consultation? And MB said there was been no analysis, and we need some consultation. MPI wasn't happy, but um, the cabinet, what the cabinet did was they, they must have said, well, thank you very much, we're going to add five more percent to the target because we want to be world leaders, so... Part of the problem here is that we, um, we, you have a minister outside cabinet who, where the, the other cabinet members won't necessarily feel um, bound by the political decisions he makes, but he's able to impose costs on the economy because nobody's really kind of watching and think, well, that's on us. Um, I think the structure of having a minister outside cabinet be able to promised checks of $30 billion uh, and, and all the rest of this stuff, has, it, it just, there hasn't been enough scrutiny and discussion of it. And the other thing is the Europeans, the NGOs will never give New Zealand credit no matter what we do because that's just misinterpreting how those things work. Um, if you look at the Fossil of the Day Award, which is one of the ways they try and shame countries, um, you know, in, uh, in the cops, it's never, it, it's, it's not often European economies that get shamed. It's always Australia, New Zealand, Japan, USA, maybe the oil petro states, um, maybe the odd, more kind of uh, market liberal um, European state. But it's hardly ever Germany, because most of these things are, are headquartered uh, intellectually. The, the, the analytics companies from which they draw their information are headquartered there and they don't buy the hand that feeds them. So it doesn't really, if you look up what other countries think about nuclear free leadership, you'll find that a lot of them don't really tell our story at all and don't regard New, New Zealand as being a particularly important player in the nuclear free story. Um, 
And I think it, that's actually a really, that, that was what occurred to me when Jacinda Ardern said that this was our nuclear free moment. I thought, well, it could well be. We could, we could choose to hang our hat on something that no one else really notices. Um, because we don't control the narrative. And that's why I think choosing a headline, basing our policy on a headline number for some sort of spectacular, we were the one who took on the biggest burden and title, is a, is a particularly bad way to structure policy. There's uh, well, another piece of good news. Uh, the, there is an exit strategy. The, there will need to be a, an exit strategy from this, and and there is one. It's not. Uh, it would need a bit of a lot of bit of diplomacy. But there's, you know, I think there there's a way out. There's a way out of um, a way out of where we've got ourselves into. Which is, oh, you need to read our business. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. I mean, the, the the problem was that they didn't. Uh, the, I mean, as a public, from the public policy point of view, uh, I, I think Dave and I have explained how we got to where we were, and very much what well, what we concluded when we went through all the documents was, this was not um, careful analysis of and and weighing up of different options and alternatives for government and saying, look, government, pros, cons, pros, cons, pros, cons, now you decide. It was, there is, we have found the one true way. And, and the nature of the, a lot of that material, and there's lots of errors in it, it was more we concluded advocacy of a position rather than analysis of plus and minus, as an analysis for government then to take the decision. I mean, clearly there were politics all going on, mm -hmm. and there's been a very, very small cohort of sort of expert advice feeding into that. And I mean, I'm quite convinced that um, you know, ration, reason will prevail and, and, and we'll have something much more rational, which what we also point to, we, we, what we need to ref is focus on our own, you know, do more. I mean, I think a lot of New Zealanders are not very happy about only doing uh, a very modest amount of reductions at home. Do some more at home and focus more on that. As a public sector antique, uh, you sort of answered my obvious question, which is where's the public sector intellectual powerhouse that challenges ministers? Uh, we don't have one in justice because, you know, someone got killed last week, so we're now going to have a new justice policy, etc. But given that we've got there, I mean, we went also into a... Uh, a, a, a pandemic without any epidemiologists in the Ministry of Health because someone 20 years before decided we didn't need them and we're lucky we had some university ones. Where, where, what's going to come? And, you know, you've suggested that the Climate Change Commission isn't probably as perfect as we'd hope it to be. Where's the intellectual grunt, the analytical capability for the, that we need for the next 20 years that's actually going to lead this? We can't have wishy-washy... Um, little five-minute wonders that join ministers' offices, party hacks for a while, um, doing this sort of stuff. Lee, I, I take the, I'm taking this as a rhetorical question. Yeah. Well, but, <laughs> no, Dave but, might have an answer. Well, well, name... Where, Lee, where, what do we do in the next 20 well, years? Name, name a thought leader amongst the New Zealand civil service. Name a visionary thought leader amongst the New Zealand civil service currently. Dave? <laughs> I'm out of date. <laughs> In the area of climate change. Anywhere. Anywhere. Well, uh, it's a bit unfair in the sense yeah. that they don't, can't really speak out. In the they used to. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. But I think... I, I, found, I found Jeff Lewis's stuff when he was a prodcom doing low emission stuff. That was pretty good. And, uh, and Simon Upton, they both brave enough to take on, uh, you know, to think a bit differently and, and um, challenge at least some parts of, uh, of uh, the kind of, um, that small cabal of people that you were talking about. So, but I probably, you know, they both had good games, I think, but I, I'm trying to be positive. No, but I mean, it's a good example, I think. I mean, Simon, of course, isn't a civil servant, but... Um, he came up with some original thinking about which was related to both the methane issue and then the, the forest issue that I put that slide up about. He, he started speculating, well, hang on, forests, are, they're not that long-lived, you know, and they're subject to various vagaries of disease and fire and things, and, and after 30 years, you know, they're no longer absorbing the carbon. So I so wonder, would that be a better match for offsetting methane emissions. Well, he, he, he tentatively said that, or it must have been about four or five years ago, he got slapped back by the establishment, you know, this is unwanted, unhelpful, but he's come back again with a much more considered report, 
and he's back to the charge. So that, no, that's an example of some of some good thinking, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, notwithstanding the importance uh, of removing CO2 from the atmosphere, the real problem seems to be temperature. Uh, removing CO2 isn't going to benefit anybody alive today. Uh, but removing, reducing temperature by increasing albedo, increasing uh, aerosols, uh, sun shading, would that not be a, um, a better expenditure of money in the shorter term? Thank you. That, that, that would benefit people alive today. That would definitely benefit young people. It would disproportionately benefit people in the developing world as well. Um, two, I don't know any uh, atmospheric physicists who don't work in the area of solar radiation management uh, who think that solar radiation management, you know, which is uh, putting particles up into the atmosphere and letting them bounce out sunlight so that the world, um, so that less sunlight makes it down to the earth in the first place, and using that to tune the temperatures. I don't know anybody who doesn't work in that area who thinks it's a good idea because it's atmospheric radiation is the two stream thing. There's solar radiation coming in, there's uh, long wave radiation going out, and um, having a solar, right, having a short wave approach, short wave solution to a long wave problem. Um, probably doesn't work and the climate would do funny things that we don't fully understand um, in response. One thing in particular is uh, you, you change rainfall um, either, uh, my understanding is you change rainfall substantially either in India or in China, both of which depend on the Himalayan plateau of your rainfall. Um, so even if you solve temperature problem or you address the temperature problem through, um, through solar radiation management, you're still left with a hydrological problem, um, which is also, you know, water's pretty fundamental to human life and other life. We've got time for one last question. Any others coming through? Uh, kia ora koutou. I'm Matt. Uh, thanks, Adrian and Dave. Uh, I'm really curious to hear about the... We talked a little bit about the government's plans to offset um, internationally, and I think you mentioned in your pie graph a large proportion of hot air um, credits that were purchased. Can you expand on that around you know how helpful these credits are and how yep. they're reducing global um, emissions? And the kind of a second prong thing, which was mentioned as well, is carbon pricing and what the appetite of um, countries internationally is on setting a price on carbon so that it can perhaps be a bit affected into the consumption patterns because yeah, i'm not we, sure whether the ets well, takes into account yeah, internal consumption on, on your on your second point is precisely what those economists were saying what those 3500 economists were saying global carbon price is what you need um, i mean the europeans are looking at something called a cbam which is a carbon border adjustment mechanism and what they're saying is well we've got a carbon price so if anyone wants to export stuff to us, we're going to check on their carbon price and they're going to be taxed on the differential. Um, it's only affect, it won't, don't, it won't touch agriculture because <laughs> their agriculture doesn't have a carbon price, but that's their plan. Um, I see it, uh, I think that there'll be a lot of, there'll be, there could be sort of coalitions of the willing where countries will agree amongst themselves maybe to liberalise trade, but providing that they respect you know, a comparable carbon price or coalitions of the willing. On your point about carbon markets, um, now we've got 35 minutes. <laughs> um, no, just briefly though, so the, the, the concept under Kyoto um, was, as I said, the planet doesn't, it's only for developed countries, rich countries have to reduce emissions. The planet doesn't care where they're reduced, so let's make it so that you can actually um, pay for some, a project in a, in a developing country and they can um, get, say, a new renewable energy plant and you can have the credits from that, you pay for it. I mean, that was, that was the whole concept. But what, what countries had who were in the Kyoto Protocol had, they had an allocation of called assigned amount units. And in the case of Ukraine and all of Eastern Europe, it got its allocation of assigned amount, that's it's how much it's allowed to emit. And if you get under that, you can sell, sell the surplus. So 
what happened was that that was before the economic um, collapse of the Soviet Union. So all these Eastern European countries were led with this massive amount of carbon emissions, carbon that they, but they didn't connect because their economies all collapsed. So it was perfectly legal to sell it. So they were selling it, but the, there was so much of it around that instead of you know, $15, $20, the price got down. Th those units were being bought at 20 cents a tonne. So that's the origin of the – that's why they call it hot air and absolutely – Nothing for the client. And the second problem with the was the main mechanism under Kyoto was called the clean development mechanism concept of rolling out um, re renewables to developing countries. Guess who benefited overwhelmingly from the clean development mechanism? Any ideas? China, India, Brazil. Economic logic, but morally questionable. So. That was, I mean, it's a good idea. They tested, you know, test out. But that's been highly controversial. I mean, a lot of developing countries are dead against carbon markets. That there was a lot of fraud going on. And it's questionable how much, how many real um, emissions reductions were made because of those carbon markets. You had a key principle called additionality. You couldn't fund something that they would have done anyway. Well, how can you prove that? So I think, to my mind, they were, you know, they, 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 have a, they may have a role. But um, that, and, and you can guarantee that if we pursue, if we put all our eggs in the um, UN basket, the, the, the UN negotiators basket, you'll have a diabolically complicated administrative system. So the much better prospect is, is um, what we call coalitions of the willing. And, and we're actually working with some uh, countries in the Asia Pacific region to create a sort of regional uh, carbon market. We could partner up with countries who, you know, you need to have a bit of integrity and in governance to make these things work. One country that um, Motu was doing some work with was uh, Colombia, who've got pretty good, pretty good integrity and, and you know, pretty good um, targets and stuff. So potentially you could see a market link up there. And also, even with developed countries linking up their ETSs. Dave, do you want to just Border finish off? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Border stuff is going to be hard no matter what. Um, the EU. Uh, ironically, given their fondness for protection, um, were complaining about Joe Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act that this might suck low carbon firms over the United States and pull them out of Europe. Now, you know, as a free market kind of guy, I, I, I like that. I think that's great. If people are competing for the same brains and for the, um, you know, perhaps that's not what I'm supposed to say with Fabians, but it, 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 it is like the idea that people are competing for smart, low-carbon uh, companies has is, is, is got to be a good thing. Um, the cross-border harmonisation of regulations is going to be hard. That's an example. Um, the coalitions of the willing will, will be tough no matter what. And, and there's a sense in which the more you do at home, the less exposed you are to that. So our price collapsed because we were linked to the EU ETS. If we go and do the same again through forestry policy, where seventy percent of our policy is based on trees somewhere else, we're going to be again exposed to whatever policy pathologies and price pathologies arise as a as a, as a consequence of that. And that's a, I think it's another reason why the more we do at home, the better. And the final point I'd make is the least just about the least popular paper I've ever written was um, with. Cameron Hepburn from uh, Oxford on where we plotted emissions per capita, uh, economy size, and the corruption perceptions index. And the basic point was that the, these investments, these, these large pots of money, are going to be investments from countries which are perceived to be well governed um, to purchase mitigation in countries that are perceived not to be. And you can, and this kind of bears on Adrian's point about the CDM. There were firms in India that created gases with horribly high global warming potentials just to incinerate them. There was no economic case for these firms to exist. They did so to harvest the money from the CDM credits they could get as a, as a result. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that can happen if you don't design a system well. And I would also say it's the kind of system that, that the kind of thing that can happen if you have a single basket approach and you're comparing things that just shouldn't be compared. But I've got to go cook dinner now. <laughs> Thank you very hey, thanks very much, David. And thanks very much, Adrian. And that's the Fabians for the year.